All right, so for my second video on cognitive function theory, I'm going to be reviewing uh, host errors, exciting tables and words about human personality. Um, I find Eric is more or less the most accurate typologist on YouTube, um, as far as I can tell. And his system is very sound um, in general. I have some reservations about it because he doesn't incorporate um, some of the things that I've, I've trying to hone in on, but just because it doesn't have that doesn't necessarily mean, or doesn't mean that it's not a very accurate system in general. So we're going to go over a little bit and I'll show you what I mean by this. So here's this. I've already uh, done the analysis for this video. Um, I have that pulled up here. An analysis of Eric's exciting tables and blah, blah, blah. So let's go over it real quick. All right, to uh, continue this analysis of, of Eric's system, I actually think it's important to just go over the pages real quick and then I'll, I'll reference my analysis as time goes on. So we're starting at, let's start at the very top just to, just to make sure everyone knows where we're at. This is the, the cover page, you know, the table of contents we're going to ignore. We're going to go down here to the first page, and this is where he sets out some types of definitions or some clarifications here he um i don't have i don't disagree with any of this i think this is all all fine and this is the the first thing that i want to analyze um Socionis and young refer to introverted functions as subjective and actually refer to functions as objective this is simply wrong and survives no scrutiny to see and we'll go over to my analysis here for this I say I agree with this. The assumption that extroversion and introversion plays part on objectivity can be excuse me, rendered obsolete by assessing literally any of the extroverted functions. Um, I would venture to say that all eight functions are, are subjective, which is different from, from Eric. Eric thinks that TI is objective, and I would say pure TI is indeed objective because pure TI is conditional logic, but humans are not capable of using pure TI perfectly. Because of that, it is possible for them to render an objective verdict on things, and definitely will happen, but in general, to say that the function as a whole, when used by humans, is objective, I, I don't know if I can necessarily say that's true. Yeah, so I, I don't disagree with any of this. I think this is just a um, continuation of what he said earlier, so we're going to go down... So here at the end, he says, and given that we make the distinction between subjects and objects by checking for their capacity to observe, to be objective is to deem that which observes irrelevant. Um, and so my response to this is uh, that this very statement will conclude that to be objective is to eliminate any trait or consideration that is a posteriori. This would conclude that conditional logic, TI, is the only objective modality in using a TI framework for analysis on any observable being inherently turns said analysis into subjective observation. Therefore, the only time we are truly objective is when analyzing a priori knowledge, which is consistent with other fields such as philosophy and mainstream psychology. In order for cognitive function theory to, to be a mainstream field of psychology, which I think it definitely can be, it needs to play well with the other fields. And so this notion that, um, that TI, when applied to knowledge of the senses, which is what a posteriori knowledge is, that TI, when applied to knowledge of the senses, is still objective, I think... I. I don't think that you can make that claim. I think that's too strong a claim. The application of TI to a priori knowledge, knowledge that is not gained from the senses, but in itself is, is already uh, derived from logic, I think that's, that's logically consistent with uh, teachings in other fields of academia. So here, Eric says, when my own perspectives conflict, which do I prioritize? Um, and I think this is very important because Eric considers the way the cognitive functions to be attentional manners and i think that's an aspect of them for sure and that's the reason why he's fairly accurate is because he's honing in on aspect and for all intents and purposes the practical application of of any cognitive function theory will look at something like your attentional manner and say okay this is what we're actually seeing but your attentional manner is only based off of what you are consciously seeing so i go over that here in my little analysis um, I'll read that off. As a means to link what we're talking about, you say prioritize here. I would say prefer. Your preference leads to a prioritization and therefore the usage of that function, which leads to strength in said function. This is a fundamental difference that is easily overlooked when considering results. So that, that just reaffirms what I was saying earlier. The, um, the process of typing someone and figuring out what functions they're displaying 
doesn't it doesn't matter this whether or not it's preference or prioritization these things this the preference effectively is um a, a, an axiom that this plays upon but it's not actually all that important for the end result analysis it is important for understanding the overall system in itself as a, as a totality i think it's very important actually so we'll go on so the first thing he says under this uh, paragraph, this heading that I talked about just a second ago is, everybody has to have at least one dominant metaphysics, and really at least several. For each def ease of definition, let's call a metaphysics a criterion that indicates which value or values ought to be preferred when they come in conflict with other values in a given context. So this is a this is playing on on the the valued functions and preferences I was talking about. And I have, I have some analysis that I wrote up for this. Um, so in general, I agree. Based on your definition of metaphysics, I would assert that every person will have a preference of four dichotomies for which their metaphysics are axonomically based on. This type of analysis is built upon Young's work and models, which are not the only way to construct a cognitive function system. Just as hierarchies are time objects created by the subject taxonomies, he, I, I'm talking about time objects created by the subject because uh, this is something he sets out in the very beginning of his system of his explanation is, is something is a time object so metaphysical things are a time object so on and so forth created by the subject anyways continue on, on taxonomies and classifications in general are time objects created by a subject in this manner I find it unreasonable to conclude that your method is wrong at the very at the moment it's just different I have concluded that MBTI is wrong but systems such as the Dave superpowers and yours are trying to fix said system in our different approaches. And so this gets back to the uh, the main thing I want to like really talk about when it comes to to introducing my system is that I'm looking at you could say I'm looking at like the the underlying the fundamental premise that everything is built upon. I'm breaking it down to the theory of mind where we can see a difference between humans and the rest of the of the animal kingdom and I'm building up from there and I'm trying to do that in tandem with the other uh, academic fields and in, in the process of doing so in order to be logically consistent certain things need to be need to be put in a certain in a specific way and so the very notion of using a taxonomy or a system that that breaks down how Jung breaks his system down, or how he broke his system down. Um, that's that's really dependent on how you want to analyze the system, and you can analyze the system in a myriad of different ways. And that's the reason why someone like well, like Eric can look at the can observe and look at the actions of others and and the things that they do, and make conclusions. And those conclusions can be virtually right, but they're not they're not necessarily wholly complete. So this uh, this entire section right here is something I'm I'm going to respond to. It looks like it's not criterion that one actively references normally. It's reflexive, like reaching for a door handle with your right hand rather than your left. The hand in this analogy is a good one, and more significantly, and more significant universal than one might initially think, because we have the capacity to understand objects through an objective frame and habitually do understand them thusly. We sometimes forget that to do so itself self an ongoing manifestation of our own cognitive habits so yeah I, I completely agree and this actually gets down to what's what I think is actually going on here you have a preference you develop a preference for which hand you open the door with just like you develop a preference for which cognitive function that you pay attention to and you use in a daily basis and that preference leads to strength that's the entire premise for which my system is built so um, yeah, I agree. The preference for which hand you open the door with or which function that you use to solve a specific problem is the crux of understanding cognitive functions, in my opinion. The most important thing to consider is that every being with theory of mind has agency. Hence, your usage of the term moral agency. This agency means that we have the capability of using all eight functions, but lead to a preference in function usage. That preference, as stated earlier, leads to function strength and works in tandem with other functions to interact with the world. So, your... This reflexive door reaching for hand analogy is is great I think it fits perfectly um, and it reinforces kind of the thing I'm I'm saying it also obviously reinforces what you're saying because you're you're honing in on or Eric yeah I don't know this is not a personal video to Eric um, Eric is honing in on on these concepts and seeing them and applying them to some extent but 
not applying them universally, which I think is necessary. So lastly, in this little section um, where it's headlined, when my perspectives conflict, which do I prioritize? In this last paragraph, I, I'm not going to focus on this stuff. This is all fine, but um, down here he says, and I'll just pull it out from this, uh, prefer the certainty of that which is approximate but generalizes over that which is experiential but incommunicable. I don't think you can objectively determine the difference between these two things because they don't share a logical basis. This, thus, this argument is probably axonomically impossible to substantiate. An object can be approximate and generalized, inexperiential and incommunicable, or any of the three. So, this is a, I think this is just like a, a little bit of a break in logic, and it's fine. Um, but I don't think it's something that, that can or should stay. And me pointing this out, I'm using this as, as a context to so, show just how much I, I agree with him in general. I'm nitpicking over this tiny little thing when these first couple pages and continuing on, I don't really see much that I have a problem with. All right, so continuing forward, um, I don't really have much more to say about, about this page and this page here. Um, I agree with most things he's saying. I don't think I, there's anything I disagree with, really. He's just setting things up. Um, I agree that these things are these things, and I agree with, with this definition for the most part, and all these nonsense, and great, and this is all fine. But down here, this is uh, getting back to something I, I said earlier, and I'll, I'll delve into a little further. Um, he says, what is a cognitive function? A cognitive function is a way of paying attention. It's an attentional manner, is, is the way he puts it. And I disagree. I think that is part of a cognitive function. And I'll, I'll read my little analysis here. I disagree, and the difference is minute, but has severe implications. I would define a cognitive function as a way of processing information. Just like when you turn a door handle, you're not consciously choosing a hand. When, when interacting with a mode of information, you're innately going to be using a specific subset of functions. For instance, if your moistness is dampened, that's a, uh, that's a thing he likes to say. If your moistness is dampened, you will have a preference between using FI and FE to address your moistness, and based on your function development, will determine how effective you will handle the dampening. And so, to extrapolate that on a little, be, little bit, because it's not exactly clear, the way you use your functions consciously is indeed going to be a, a manner of paying attention, uh, a way of paying attention. But your, co your functions are also unconscious in usage and based off of preference, just like the, the opening the door handle with your hand is an unconscious thing. You're not actively thinking about it. You're not actively considering how you walk and so on and so forth. These are unconscious things that you just learn and develop and things like that over time. Um, and the same was true with, with these. Your, your unconscious ways of, of dealing with things breaks the idea that they'd cognitive functions are just a way of paying attention because that's, that's not the entire story. That's not the whole truth. It's partially true, but it's not the entire truth. Continuing on with these definitions um, that he uses, he says, uh, what's a cognitive function stack? A cognitive function stack, is he, what he says, is the order of habitual preference by which a person expresses one manner of attention over another. And I agree. I agree completely. This preference also leads to usage, which leads to confidence and strength in said function. All right, so to continue our analysis, um, I'm going to keep going down this. These, for the most part, are true. I don't see anything I particularly disagree with. This, the only thing that is, like, up for debate is this notion of fairness. I think all F and T types can come to a conclusion about fairness and so whatever. But for the most part, these are true, and I agree, yeah. Um, J or P, I don't see any of these that I disagree with really I'm not really worried about it okay getting down here into the the notion of cognition cognition means too little is, is his analysis cognition refers to the mental processes that each living conscious human experiences 24 hours a day for the whole of their lives you might say that cognition just means being human but that wouldn't be a very useful way of understanding what goes on in our heads after all not all the parts of being are the same of for every human can't we draw some distinctions? Yes, we can. So, go to my analysis. I think it's important to frame the entire discussion of cognitive function theory around the concept called theory of mind, which is, he effectively says, as being human, right? The ability to understand that there is a difference between a subject's perception and knowledge basis is the basis for agency and co cogitation. Therefore, cognition is simply the encapsulation 
of all thought related to moral agency, as you would call it. In this manner, a cognitive function is indeed too vague. This should be virtually the same information between the two systems. The key difference is the ordering of separation. So what I'm talking about here is, is perceiving, judging, the, blah, blah, all this nonsense. Cognition in general, he, this, this is all virtually the same. I think one thing to note is, is um, Eric wants to separate these by, by introversion and extroversion before he separates them by feeling and thinking. Um, so he would do something like feel like judging, introversion, introverted judging, extroverted judging, and then introverted feeling, ex introverted thinking, extroverted thinking, extroverted feeling, something like that. Um, I disagree, and the reason why I disagree is because these these things here are seen in other aspects of psychology. You can see a clear difference in this the interest in people and clear distance difference in interest in things. And using that statistical analysis from mainstream psychology, I think, is important. I think it also should be logically consistent. Therefore, this is a discernible breaking point, whereas this is less of a discernible breaking point. This should be virtually the same information between the two systems, and the key difference is the ordering of separation. So this that thing I was just talking about. The dichotomies that we create can be observed in various ways. Based on the definitions that I use and logical precepts that I adopt for this system, it seems appropriate to differentiate between introverted functions and extroverted functions at a lower level than Eric does. And that's that's what I was just referencing. This analysis takes into account the variation in seemingly different types of each function, such as the discernible difference. Let me just fix that. Discernible difference between ISTPTI and INTPTI. The seemingly stark difference in functions is why systems like DSP and Socionics Model B look to change how we view functions. So one thing to note here is that. Um, his system is braced, broken down in a fundamentally different way to some extent because he puts the the FI or the introversion extroversion above um, where I put it, I think. And because of that, I don't feel that it's appropriate for me to really analyze his, his type matrix. I think that will fall into place naturally as it goes on. Um, so that's what I say here, and then although this does dip into one of the key issues when discussing cognitive function theory, in order for there to be any unification of systems or recognition recognition of a viable field, you need set definitions. I think this is incredibly important. Set definitions is like the number one thing I would argue is is the problem with cognitive function theory in general is that we can't we can't determine what the actual definitions are. They're they're too nebulous. Some of them aren't. D functions are fairly well established, but even the S functions aren't that well established. I will know that the sub most substantive aspect of my system understanding is incorporating fundamental ideas from other fields of science into cognitive function theory. Okay, whatever. Um, one thing to note here, if we go back to this, he has four different types of people, and he breaks this down to NISI as the epistemologists, the knowers, um, NESE as the actors, the doers, and then he breaks it down as TEFI instead of TIFI continuing this pattern. He breaks it down with TEFI as the subjectivist and TIFE as the objectivist. And going back to my analysis here, um, I think it's interesting that you group, this is this is talking about, I think it's interesting that you group TE with FI and TI with FE, as these are also grouped in this manner with the dual axiom system the socionomics model B introduces. In the future, I might find it appropriate to use this axiom as a basis for translating my system with Eric's system. So in order to continue this, I'm going to use, I'm going to pull up my system real quick a little bit, and that is here. And I'm going to note that... Um, this is something I talk about quite a bit. The valued functions is has the, how they break down with positive, negative added from socionomics model B. I'm not going to mention that any further. I will be creating videos on this in the future. Um, this is something that is the information's out there, and I and I'll be putting that more actively. But for the context of this video, the people that are that fall into the negative FI, positive FE axes are in um, the beta and gamma quadra, the people that fall into the F negative FE, positive FI, and the inverse of that axis, fall into the alpha, the delta quadra. Um, 
keep in mind that the the lowercase j and p that means that this is sociologics. So all the introverts uh, should be switched around. So INTP instead of uh, instead of INTJ, and they do that because. The an INTJ or an INTP, their most dominant function is they're judging TI function. Therefore, that should be noted as their most dominant function. Anyways, um, this this is a fundamental axis that these are break, broken down upon. So to continue this analysis, we're going to have to go down quite a bit, and it's it's almost reaching the end, due to the uh, the fundamental differences between. Um, Socioeconomics model B, which I'm using as a part of my method, and in the way that um, Eric is breaking these down, the definitions, which is the probably the major thing. At this point, I think analysis of of these things is um, not really appropriate. But for the purpose of this video, we're going to stop here with the the um, this statement here. The talking of famous people taxonomy of human attention entirely rejects the Velocity model A. The talking with famous people taxonomy mostly affirms the conscious and shadow stack mechanics as per MBTI, BB, and others. And so going back here, I haven't fully analyzed or uncurved the blocks of Model A myself. I am actively considering the conscious functions for each type, but in regards to the notion of conscious functions is muddy for me. I assume that to reach a conclusion regarding unconscious functions or conscious functions would require a rather large sample size of testing that actively avoids cognitive biases. And that's something that I think is um, kind of plaguing me, the typology community in general, is that every single person here is trying to develop or look into a system that's not, not a structured yet it's not actually complete and so they they have all sorts of cognitive biases and cognitive dissonance and, and this is actually a huge problem when it comes to the renin dichotomies and things like that the letter dichotomies that, that we talk about with the ei and so on and so forth um so i want to avoid that but um in general i would consider socioeconomics model a the um i would at least consider the strength of the functions and the valuation, the valued portion of those functions, to be fairly accurate. I don't know whether or not I would consider the rest of it accurate. I haven't been able to analyze it to that extent yet, and I, I, I don't know how long it'll take me. But I, I don't really want to. I don't, I don't think that I'm going to be able to parse that information by myself just due to these cognitive biases. So with that understanding, I'm gonna have to have conversations with people that either disagree with me or have a have an analysis that's different from mine. So from here on out, the rest of um, his system, which there's a lot more left as far as pages go, is really just breaking down um, things like the the placement of the of the functions and going through this whole process and and showing some things that are helpful to um, whatever unconscious FIU blah 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 and so on and so forth. Um, talking about the each individual function and like kind of like buzzwords it seems like that um, things like this I I don't I don't think it's correct for me to provide further analysis of this because there's just something that's fundamentally different between the systems and mainly those are those are definitional based and based off of the introduction of positive and negative functions so that's what I say here in my conclusion, in general, I don't disagree with your system that much. I think there is a discussion to be had about definitions, and probably the large areas, largest area of separation is the introduction of the positive and negative functions, which aren't fully going to make sense because the definitions we use now are based from the perspective of the alpha quadra, which is Eric's quadra. So Eric's understanding of functions is perfectly apt because whoever created the system as it is and the functions, the de function definitions as they are, was an ENTP or an INTP or whatever, and, and so they're in in the context of someone that's already coming from that that position, that mind frame. When fully introducing positive and negative functions, what it does is it kind of aligns the the quadras, the four groupings of four, into two larger groupings of two, and it fixes the reading dichotomies. It it fixes um, a couple other logical inconsistencies that I found. And I'll be analyzing that further in my coming videos. But for now, I think this is going to be the end of um, of my analysis of his system. Like I said, going down here, these are all like infographs and things like that. And the next thing he has here is is um, really argumentation types and things like that, such as objectivity versus subjectivity, 
and these are these are important to to look at too but most of these are just argument by definition and so it's not something I'm gonna I'm gonna be able to to deal with without figuring out what the definitions are completely anyways that's it for this video I'm gonna be uploading content tomorrow I'm gonna be uploading two typology videos as well as a video that goes over politics stuff and I'm gonna keep that schedule up for the time being as much as I can these videos for the the cognitive function theory has they're both gonna be fairly long and that is not the intention going forward these are particularly long for today going forward they're gonna be somewhere around five minutes maybe even less maybe a little more but definitely not as long as these and if you like this video please hit uh, like and subscribe and leave a comment down below if you want me to talk about any subject provide any analysis on anything please uh, also post down below with that and I look forward to interacting with you guys going forward thank you so much